my approach has always been, if I were new to this subject, what would I want to know? Hey there, you're tuned into Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 498, with today's guest, Mr. Richard Baitluck. Who am I? I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, founder here at Whistlekick, and everything that we've got going on is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what that means, go to whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's a place for our store, our projects, our products, everything that we've got going on. You can get to it from there. And one of the things there is the store, the place where we sell stuff. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you'll save 15% off, well, anything. If you haven't been to the website lately, now is the time to check it out. If you want to see stuff related to this or any of the other episodes of Martial Arts Radio, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. The show comes out twice a week, and the purpose of the show is to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to help the show, if you want to help us towards our goals, there are a number of ways you can do that. You can share an episode, maybe make a purchase. Tell a friend, follow us on social media, pick up one of our books, leave a review, or support our Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. That's what we're talking about. Five bucks or more gets you more content, more podcasts, more videos, more, more, more. To those of you who have contributed to the Patreon, there are quite a number of you out there. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Helps offset the costs of running this show, which is, as you might imagine, quite expensive. I've known about today's guest for a while. He's been part of our community. He's been following the show and one of the more active commenters in the Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes Facebook group. I've come to value his feedback greatly. And when we took a step back and started looking at who from kind of internally we could invite to the show, he was the first name that came up. So here we are, my conversation with Mr. Richard Baitlick. Hey, Jeremy. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? I'm great. Sorry, I was a couple minutes late. I it's was okay. trying to figure it's out right. the uh, audio here. And hey, does that sound good. okay? Sounds great. Oh, good. Sounds great. Um, you know, it's funny. When, when I had given your name to Leslie to reach out, <laughs> I realized, why did I not talk to you like three years ago? Oh, <laughs> I, I have no good say, reason. I thought you were going to say, I, I, you, you said, <laughs> we're going to need to figure out how to say this guy's name. <laughs> oh, we've had harder names. <laughs> I, 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 when, when you submitted the guest form and, and you spelled it out that way, suddenly I realized, oh, that absolutely makes sense. Oh, okay. What, good. What's, the, what's the heritage? It, it's that? Polish. Okay. Um, there's no wits or ski at the end, but it, it is Polish and there's lots of uh, people in Poland and actually in Germany too with that name. It's one of the toughest two-syllable names you'll encounter. It's rough. Yeah. I, <laughs> as... as Lessie and I, you know, talked about you. I I think I ended up with like six syllables for your name. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But I I know the pain, I guess. Not really. It's not that dramatic of of having a Polish last name that nobody can pronounce. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's you hear all kinds of things. I guess the one good aspect of it is if you want to be found on the internet, it's pretty easy. And uh, my dad has the same name except for the middle, the middle name. So um there's only one of me in the whole world, as far as I can tell. I'm sure at some point there'll be another Richard, but uh, at this point, I'm pretty easy to find on online. Is that a Polish thing? Because my my father and grandfather did the same thing. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Like my dad, uh, he's Richard Chester, and his father's name was Chester uh, Lewis, I think, from his. I don't remember what that's from, but uh, and then before that, it's just Polish versions of all those all those names. Hmm. It's funny. I, I years ago when I was in IT, I had a a client call me up and, and say, you know, your last name is Polish. And I said, yeah. Do you practice any of the Polish traditions? And I, oh. and I said, I, I don't, I don't know what any of those are. So I must not be. Yeah. And she was very sad. <laughs> yeah. My do- one of my daughters really got into being Polish. Like we had uh, at their school, they had international day. And so both girls actually decided that they wanted to dress up in Polish costumes. So we didn't really even know what that meant. So uh, my wife did some searching online and found these like, no kidding, made in Poland, traditional Polish girl costumes. And so they were very, very into it. And as a result of that, we sort of got reintroduced to one of my great aunts who, who since passed away, but um, she was like 95, 96. And we visited her and she was like, she's very, very Polish. That's the generation where their father and their older brother came from Poland, like in the night, you know, early 1900s. 
So yeah, that was pretty cool. And then I met a Polish girl uh, at my Krav Maga school. And I knew right away she was Polish. I think she even had a t-shirt with a Polish flag on it. And that was the lady I ended up writing um, the stretching book with. Oh, cool. So yeah, it, it's funny how is that, those... is that the one that's on my desk? I yes. Book. Yeah, I figured I I'd send that to you. Right here on my desk. There you go. Yeah. You won't see me in there except I think at the very end in the bio shot, uh, I was not the guy you want taking pictures of showing how inflexible I am. But uh, yeah, that was a, <laughs> yeah, that was a, a fun project. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Nice. How did you end up doing that? Well, I got really burnt out in cybersecurity several years ago and I wanted to do something different. So I basically took a year off. And during that time, I thought I would like to work on a project that has absolutely nothing to do with my former life. Well, maybe not nothing to do because I had written books before. I'd had published books before, but they had been with established publishing houses and they had been on cybersecurity. So uh, when I had met this, this lady, Anna Wansley, her Polish name is Gruczynska, she said, hey, I've always wanted to write a book. About, and I would, you know, I know how to do stretching because that's one of my uh, therapy expertise. Is, so I said, oh, well, I've written several books and I'm actually looking for a new project. So we, we said, yeah, well, she said, you really know how to do this? I said, yeah, of course. Uh, I don't know anything about stretching, but I know how to write books. I know how to <laughs> take care of almost everything else. My wife, um, she's not quite a professional photographer, but she's certified. She's taking classes and all that. She can do the photos and uh, the stuff we don't know how to do, we'll, we'll get some help. And uh, we... We probably took about a year. It was really difficult, you know, having two people work on any project, as you might imagine. Uh, it can extend the timeline quite a bit. But at the end of it, we wrote this book, and uh, it's one of my favorite projects of all time, just because it was a, a break from what I had been doing before. It was just something completely different that I wanted to try. You just kind of exposed something that, that I find really interesting in the martial arts, and I don't know if listeners caught it or not. You mentioned that you are not terribly flexible. Yes. <laughs> and you wrote a book on flexibility. Yeah. <laughs> and as martial artists, we tend to think that the ability to do something is a one-to-one -one correlation with your ability to teach it. And of course, if you go to anything that's not martial arts, you realize that that's not true at all. Go to any gymnastics club and look at who's coaching and you'll quite often see uh, uh, a, a big discrepancy. Yeah, uh, that kind of invalidates that that one to one correlation. So, was it an asset in this project because you weren't flexible? Yes, there's there's a couple of lessons I've taken away from the book writing process, and I learned these with my cybersecurity books early on. Um, there are very few readers who are experts, almost by definition. Most readers. The people who are buying books or instructionals or other educational um, materials, they're trying to learn something. So they're most likely going to be beginners. So when you're writing, unless you're writing for a very, very narrow audience, and that's generally not going to be at the level of a book. I mean, that would be more like some kind of academic paper or maybe a specialized presentation. Most books are written for more of that beginner mind. So if you, do, you as the author don't bring the beginner mind to the project, you're going to lose your audience right away. Uh, I've tried to sort of work my way through that with some of my earlier works where I said, this is the level of knowledge I expect you to have because I'm not going to just repeat the world to, to get you to this point. You know, read these other five books before you read mine. Uh, but definitely from the stretching book, I was not the, the subject matter expert. Anna was. She knew she's a NASMA certified trainer. She had all these routines. She had worked with clients. She's like, okay, I want to do this. I just don't know how to write. My, my, you know, I'm Polish. I speak English, but my English is not going to be as smooth as a native speaker. And I had the I had the organizational skills. I had a photographer. I even converted my basement into a studio. That's what you see in the pictures. Um, we bought professional lights, all of that. So I provided not only the sort of the, the infrastructure to get the writing done, but also uh, that beginner's mind of uh, is are we going to provide what someone who is looking for some help needs? Is this going to speak to them? And you mentioned earlier that working on projects with someone else can often extend the timeline. And, and I've certainly found that to be true. And I think if anybody thinks back to doing group projects in high school, yeah, they would, they would, <laughs> they would remember that. How long did this book take? It took about a year. It's and... thick. I mean, it's, it's thicker than I think just about any non-academic book on stretching I've seen is. And the photos are great. Yeah. Yeah. It, 
listeners are going to think that that you've you've paid me for this. And I, oh no, I appreciate that. No, I, well, it's not it's not a giant book compared to the ones I've written before. Like my first book that I wrote, I was approached by a publisher in two thousand, and they said we want you to write a book on cybersecurity. And I said, I'm not ready. I've only been in the field a few years. There's a lot more that I want to say about a certain topic. Let's just keep in touch. Three years later, I said, I think I'm ready. I'd been doing consulting, um, dealing with a lot of different types of intrusions. I said, I think I'm ready. They had to cut me off at just over 800 pages because they said, we got to get <laughs> wow. this book out, right? And I was just, so what I did, I said, fine, let's cut it here. And the next 10 chapters are going to be my second book, which came out ex right away afterwards. It was kind of like the first book was the Declaration of Independence, or no, first book was the Constitution, and then the second book was the uh, Bill of Rights. That's the way I kind of thought of it. Um, because I just had so much to say. And, and in the process of writing, you learn a lot. Um, my approach has always been, if I were new to this subject, what would I want to know? Or if, if I wanted to learn about this subject, what are the topics that I need to understand? And when you find when you're writing something is you don't know all the answers. You have to go out and either find them or you have to discover them yourself in the process of, of research and experimentation and, and all that. And I've always been more of a practitioner type person. I'm not, a, uh, I'm not very, very big on theory or um, sort of other, ac other aspects of writing. So um, I've taken that approach with, with all the books. And when we wrote the stretching book, we said, you know, what are the things that we want to cover? Okay, these three topics. What are the things people need to know about these three topics? A, B, C, boom. So once you have the outline, um, it, I don't want to say the book writes itself because it's it does not, but you get a much better idea of of where you need to go. And that I I, I give that advice to many aspiring authors or people who are working. I, I talk to I don't do it as a profession or anything like that, but people will say, "Hey, I've always wanted to write a book on this. What do you think?" And um, that's some of the advice I give. It's funny because that's my process too. You know, I've written a, a number of books and oh yeah, yeah. Started a bunch of outlines and it, it starts with the topic and then what are the things you have to say? And it just becomes an outline with more and more and more sub sections. And if you really if you follow it down as far as you want to go, those become the deepest ones become the sentences and you just write and write and those are your headings and there's your book. Yeah. Isn't it isn't it amazing that the process that hopefully many of us learned in grade school actually can work <laughs> yeah yeah it there, there aren't a whole lot of things from from <laughs> elementary school that i think i i use today uh you know long division doesn't come out very often <laughs> right fractions you know my multiplication tables aren't common but how to write something in a convincing if not compelling way certainly happens often yeah i think if we if we if we had educators take more of an approach, and I think this happens this day, these days, my, when I was in school decades ago, I don't think this was the case, but if they took more of an approach that said, we are trying to equip you with tools to interact with the world, it would make, it, would make it easier for me to understand why I was doing something. So that process we just talked about for writing, this is a tool that you will be able to use to organize your thoughts so that later on, if you need to express them in a presentation or to a prospect, a, uh, you know, an audience, whatever, this is a tool you have. Uh, calculus. Calculus on the surface is exceptionally boring, but it is a tool to interact with the world to describe a certain set of conditions. Like if you need to find this answer, this is a tool you can use. That was never, ever the way it was presented to me. It was, here's the way to take, an, uh, to do an integral, here's the way to do a derivative. And it just meant nothing. It was just a process. And uh, I think that's actually an interesting parallel with martial arts. Um, if you say this is a tool that we're using to interact with the world, um, whether that's a combative situation or a stressful situation or uh, an area where you should be situationally aware, um, these are tools you can use as opposed to this is just something we do here. And if you want to be part of this community, you have to emulate it. Mm. And I, th I think that's a, a great point for me to, to poke at a little bit, because one of the things that I've come to learn about you and listeners, I don't remember how long you've been around, but as long as I remember back and doing this show, I remember seeing your name in the comments. You, you either, either you snuck in and made such a splash that I forgot you weren't there at some <laughs> point, or you've been around for, for a while. Remind, when, did, when did you find the show? Well, I got back into martial arts as a thing I was doing a lot in 2016. Okay. So my guess is 
with, with that initial surge of, I want to learn everything I can about this topic. I found your podcast and started binging. Any podcast I decide to jump into, I don't start with wherever the, the listener is or whatever, wherever the author is. I go right to episode one. Oh, wow. So that's what I did. So I've, okay. it took me you know, several months to catch up to where you were. And then, um, yeah, I've been with you ever so, since. So that would have been about a year and a half, you know, somewhere around a year and a half, maybe after we'd started the show. And your comments have often been um, almost academic in the way that you look at things. Uh -huh. And I've come and and, and I, I'm going to be completely transparent here. I've come to learn that if I get a notification that you've made a comment on something, it is often going to be critical, but not in the negative way that we're used to on social media. Oh, that's cool. Well, I've taken a lot of what you said to heart. And I think in my late 40s now and in earlier 40s as well, I've chilled out quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> I think in the early days of like in say in my 20s when I was when I was uh you know, you know how you're trying to make your way through the world and figure out sure. who you are and who you stand, what you stand for. And there's a sense that if you're not out there saying what you think, then you're not sort of defined as a person. I think that is what comes across a lot in the, and especially in younger people's comments, is they're trying to define who they are and they treat any difference to that as a threat. And uh, so, I, I mean, my early days of security, I would say, this is the way it is. And if you don't believe this, I can't understand. You know, I was very strident about that. But these days, yeah. I'm like, well, listen, people have different points of view and it, the world isn't going to end. Now, <laughs> it's interesting, though, in, in, in the age of, of uh, coronavirus right now, some of these consequences can be life threatening. Right. But um, that's also a lens that you can use to compare to everything else where you can just say, look, dude, chill out. It's not uh, it's not the end of the world. And I think that that's uh, my, I guess, perspective on you and why I wanted to have you on the show is this, this interesting ability to express yourself in a way that I actually really appreciate because you'll, you'll comment on something and it makes me think. And anybody who's long listened to the show knows that's really the entirety of the goal here is to get people to think, mm. to think for themselves, you know, to listen to what these guests say. I bring on guests that I know are going to say things I disagree with because I don't want to live in an echo chamber. I want to hear what people think about martial arts all over the world, different experiences, different styles, yeah. because I believe that makes me better. And I would assume if people are listening more than a few episodes that they're finding similar, if not the same value, that it's making them better as martial artists by considering these things. And you add to that conversation by oh. making me and, and anyone else who sees your comment consider things. So it doesn't surprise me. I didn't know until we got on today that you were in information security. I didn't know that you were yet another of these IT martial arts intersections yeah. that we've had so many of. But it makes sense now in hindsight. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think part of it too is I have had a, an exceptionally broad exposure to different martial arts styles. Um, I don't know how many white belts I've had, but it's probably on the order of a dozen. And that is the wow. result of be, one being in the military and, and two just moving. Um, so I've, I've had to be at different locations and try different styles. And so I haven't tried every style. I'm not a uh, guru Dan and Asanto who is, like a black belt at every style. Like I said, I'm basically a white belt at everything with, with the exception of a few that I've managed to stick around for a few years in. Uh, but as a result of that, many times when people are talking, I can think, oh yeah, I've, I tried that. I remember in you know, my very first Shotokan form or, or I remember when I, when I tried uh, Filipino martial arts and, and I, yeah, I do know that there's, some people call it Arnis and some people call it Eskrima or Kali. And it basically comes, depends from what part of the islands you come from. So a lot of these things, I've tried a little bit so I can sort of put myself on those person's shoes. And even if I haven't, say like Aikido, um, I know guys who do Aikido and they're good guys. So, you know, why jump on that bandwagon of, of people who say bad things about Aikido? Now, there are a few that I haven't tried and I don't really know how effective they would be. But at the end of the day, and you've made this point very well, Jeremy, I think, which is, I think should influence people's point of view. It's what is, what is 
your purpose for training. And in uh, Sifu Smith, T.W. Smith, he says the same thing. That people have different objectives for training. If you're training simply for the community, if you just want to be part of a group, um, who cares really how combat effective it is or if you're going to get slaughtered in, in MMA? Or if you're training for fitness, uh, as long as you stay in shape, then that's good for you. If your goal, though, is you, know, you want to, uh, let's say you're in the military, or I've trained with people who are... Um, uh, what are the the, what are they, the marshals who go on are air marshals, right? They, mm, um, yeah. their their skill set, what they're looking for is completely different, and they might not care about the community or whatever. They need to know things that will keep themselves and their their you know, passengers and such uh, alive. Uh, so if you keep that in mind and you say, well, this person who's making a comment, they're coming from the perspective of of this group versus another. Well, you know, then we can all get along. Well said. Twelve white belts. So I, I like think, that. yeah, I think we, <laughs> like we got to roll back here. Let's, let's go back to the beginning. When was the first one? So when I was a kid, I wanted to do karate because my friend Paul, I thought was just a ninja. I had saw I saw him fall backwards off of a deck when we were playing some, you know, outside game as kids and he landed on his feet and ran away. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. How did you do that? And I asked him, he said, oh, I you know, do karate. And so I, I talked to, I think it was about fourth grade. I, I learned about this. And I talked to my parents and they said, you have one choice. You can either, you know, you can only do one after school activity of any kind. And I was a, a Cub Scout at the time and really liked scouting and I ended up staying with that. So I didn't really do an organized martial art until I was a cadet at the Air Force Academy in 1990. And as a cadet, you have to box your freshman year. And I ended up boxing intramurally as well my sophomore year because I was the only guy who was scrawny enough to fit into it one of the weight categories, I can't remember which one it was, but it was, it was ridiculously low. And there's a whole, you know, that was, uh, that was a bad experience. Um, but we also had to do combatives. So the air forces version of, you know, early combatives, we did that. Um, and then I took for gym, I took judo and I made the mistake of bringing, well, let me just finish. And then I also took as a, just after school club type thing, uh, uh, karate and it turned out to be Shotokan karate and I mentioned judo earlier I took judo as a gym class and I made the mistake this is how green I was I made the mistake of thinking I could use my karate gi in the judo class uh, and after a few rips and tears I realized well this is not the right thing to do <laughs> so I, I borrowed a gi like everybody else did um, but that was that was how I started back then at the Air Force Academy 1990 1991 um, doing those those four wow oh cool I've actually been out to the Air Force Academy. Oh, um, nice. I was, I was part of a recruitment class and probably the only person there out of, you know, two, 300 uh, high school juniors who had no intention of going. I was just like, you're putting me up for a week. I'm going to come hang out. Did you go to the, was it the summer scientific seminar or was it something yeah. else? Oh, it was? Yeah. yeah. Oh, neat. What, what year did you go? Uh, that would have been 90, summer of 96. Okay. That's yeah. cool. So some of the kids who... Um, who were younger than me were probably were showing you around because uh, I graduated in 94 and I went to that same program in the summer of 89. Um, yeah, that's cool. And, and I think the last, the last thing I'll share, cause you'll get this and, and it's a fun anecdote for the, for the listeners. I don't think I've shared this before. I was very small. I was probably 40 pounds less than I am now. And dorm Olympics were, were a thing. And, and <laughs> the way they presented that was that this was something that all of you did at some point. And uh, I was the smallest person, of course, in the group. So I was the one strapped with the helmet for the, uh, not PC uh, of a term now, but the midget toss. Oh, as yeah. we pulled out all of the mattresses, lined the hallway, and four of the largest boys picked <laughs> me up and hurled me down the hallway for distance. And uh, yeah, that was a fun day. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it is, it is amazing what people will figure out to entertain themselves when you're essentially, uh, I don't want to say quite a prisoner, but you're almost a prisoner for four years uh, because you, you basically can't leave or you, your ability to leave is very limited. And the years we're talking about are all pre-internet mm. um, with maybe one phone call a, a week. So yeah, there were... <laughs> That I never participated or had that sort of thing, but we had plenty of other similar activities that um, you know young people come up with when they have nothing else to do in their dorms. <laughs> so you come out of the academy with experience in boxing and combatives and karate and judo, and then what? Yeah, um, so I went to a master's program at uh, Harvard in 
at, you know, right, right out of school, which is really awesome because it gave me a chance to have a civilian educational experience after spending four years in a military setting. Um, and the Kung Fu TV series was being shown on, in reruns on TNT. And I was, I watched one of the episodes and I had never seen, I didn't see it in the early seventies. I was just too young. I was alive, but just, I was a baby. And I watched Kung Fu and I thought, this is so awesome. This is amazing. So immediately I went to the yellow pages because again, the internet wasn't that you know, big a thing yet. And I, sure enough, place where I'm living, there's a Kung Fu school right down the street, you know, a couple miles away. And I still remember I called up. I called up the school and I, I spoke with Sifu Michael Makaris and it was this Michael Makaris Kung Fu Academy in Billerica, Massachusetts. And I talked I to him that, on the phone. I know that name. Oh, do you really? Yeah, yeah. He would be a fascinating guy to have on. Um, he, if you, you know, you have your question of who has influenced you the most and you know, you're not supposed to say a teacher cause he's not my teacher now, but this is a guy who I only trained with for two years hmm. and yet he has had just a profound effect on the way uh, I see martial arts I mean, he's a, he's a traditional Kung Fu teacher. You know, it's basically forms, a little bit of kickboxing, but his philosophy and his outlook on life and the way he tries to live is just so inspirational. And so, yeah, I, I trained with him for two years. I went to his school and I went all in. You know, I, I trained as a student. Uh, eventually, I was helping to teach, help teach the kids' classes, which if you ever had to teach, and I know you have, but uh, listeners have ever had to teach four and five-year-olds, you'll know what I mean, what that's like, quite an experience. Um, yeah, so that was, that was a wonderful two years uh, training at that school. And then once again, I had to move cause I, I finished my program and I had to go to, uh, Air Force Intel school, officer Intel school in San Angelo, Texas. And I went there and, uh, uh, again, I look, okay, what, what can I, what can I train here? And it was basically really, I just seem to remember only one choice and that was, uh, Mr. Baker's Taekwondo school. Um, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but, uh, I called him up and sure enough, he's like, yeah, sure. Come on by. We'll see. We'll see what you, you know, what you, what you think. And he was an ITF Taekwondo instructor. And I remember thinking this is completely different, but it's a little bit like karate. So I think I can do this. And I remember the first time sparring with him and he was just, he was just a quiet guy. He had a goatee. He was, he was very nice, but I remember sparring and thinking this, this guy has a, has like a power in him that I am not seeing. And then I felt like a brush of air against my left temple. And I remember, and I looked at him and he could tell by the look on my face. And he said, yeah, that was my right foot. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, Oh my goodness, this is so not, this is so completely different than what I had in, experienced with the, the Kung Fu school. This was your own, your own Billy Jack moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was just off the charts. I had no idea that anybody could even, even move like that. Cause, cause, uh, my Kung Fu Sifu, he was like a more of a, like a kickboxer type, like very heavy in the boxing. And this guy was with the feet. I just couldn't believe it. Uh, but also at his school, he was learning, um, uh, Arnis, modern Arnis, the Pressa system. And so he had integrated, he had separate classes for mostly it was double stick in a little, uh, Ispati dagger, you know, stick and, and knife. And so I picked that up and I got the little vest and I started doing that kind of stuff, which I really loved. Um, but again, I had to move after uh, a little less than a year. And I went to San, Ange or, sorry, San Antonio, Texas. And I, I looked for my styles. None of them were there or the ones that I had found, they didn't really seem that good. But I found a Wing Chun school. And I think at this point, I, I went through the period that everyone does in their early martial arts career, which is the Bruce Lee adulation phase. And I remember learning more about Bruce Lee and hearing, well, Wing Chun was the art that he first learned. So this must be amazing. And uh, I went to a Wing Chun school. And this was my first encounter with a bad teacher. And there were signs that I recognized that it took me a while to recognize, but not that long, like maybe a couple months before I was out of there. And, and the signs were things like, whenever an attractive woman would pass by outside the school, the instructor would stop class, leer at her, and then resume teaching, which I had never encountered before. That was wow. bizarre. The other thing he did quite a bit that I remember to this day was he would strike the students really hard, like really violently, and even like groin strike type stu uh, striking the students. And people just accepted this as this is fine. You know, this is proof that you need to improve your pigeon toe stance, whatever that is that you're doing. 
And I just realized this is not the place for me. I, I don't know what's up with this guy. And then I even, by that time, the internet was like a thing and you could do research. And I did some research on who his instructor was and who his instructor was. And there was a, there was a uh, history of ambushes of other Wing Chun instructors and just crazy violence. And I thought, nah, this is not in line with uh, what I want to study. So I found another school, um, but this was at American Kempo School. And I tried that and totally different. The instructor was a guy who raised dogs on his farm outside of San, uh, San Antonio. And um, he was just a good guy. And the instructors, you know, the other instructors were cool. And he would bring in people from the outside. Like we had, we actually had Ed Parker Jr., um, the, the son of the founder, show up and teach a seminar. And we went out to dinner with him. And it was, it was you know, a mix of that sort of community, but also, um, you know, the other things. He, he, he'd had a, a, you know, kickboxing fitness class that I took just to stay in shape. And so he had all, you know, it was all working together pretty nicely there. Um, but again, I had to move because <laughs> I was, uh, I actually got out of the Air Force at that point. And, and uh, when I came to the Northern Virginia area, I, I looked for a couple schools, but I didn't find anything I liked or the instructors um, that I thought were teaching in a way that I wanted to. So I ended up taking a break and that break lasted uh, 15 years. 15? Really? Yeah. That surprises <laughs> me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I kind of lost myself, honestly. Um, I got into a new job. Um, I, I started to have health problems around 2006, 2007. And I foolishly, I just thought, well, this is what happens when you start to get old. Like I was in my high thirties approaching 40 and I thought, well, I just, I guess this is what happens rather than saying, no, there's probably a medical condition here. And eventually I, I basically self-diagnosed as having rheumatoid arthritis. Um, thank you, WebMD or, you know, all the offline medical stuff, but it was true. I ended up seeing a rheumatoid uh, doctor, you know, an RA specialist and she did the tests and she's like, yeah, you actually have this. I don't, she said, she said, you basically figured out what you had. And it took a, about half a year before we refined a combination of, of medications to give me some relief. Um, and that was, you know, in, two, in 2015. So by 2015, I had gotten myself back together and my joints didn't feel like they were, you know, eating themselves all the time. And at the end of that year, I decided, you know, I sort of did a, some introspection and I said, what's the thing that I really enjoyed in life that was sort of a thing that I did? It wasn't related to my family, you know, my kids, my wife what is it that I really like to do? And I listened to that, that small, still voice that we all have, but it's often drowned out by the noise of the world and even our, you know, other parts of our, our mind. And I remember thinking, I really liked martial arts. That was something that I really liked to do. Why don't I try that again? And uh, this is, you, you're probably not going to believe this, but I think I can thank Master Ken for finding my system that I went to next. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it might've been because Master Ken was on your show or... I don't remember how, but somehow I heard of Master Ken and I looked at some of his videos and I saw an act he did at a Krav Maga global ceremony in the UK. And I thought, okay, this is funny. Obviously he's, this guy's hilarious. And I recognized immediately he was a Kempo guy by the way he moved and everything. But then I said, well, what is, what's this Krav Maga? And I'd heard a little bit about it through the, you know, popular media, you know, become popular with the Bourne movies and all that. And so I looked at it and sure enough, there's a Krav Maga school, like, few miles away, maybe more than a few miles, maybe half an hour away, but definitely within driving distance. And they did something very smart, which I recommend to anybody, anyone who's a martial arts instructor out there. They had an eight week trial program, not free, you paid for it. So as a consumer, you'd say this has to have some value. If you see an eight week program, and it's free, you don't value it, but you know, it costs money and you expect it to show up for the eight lessons and this and that. But it, because it was eight weeks, it made me think, if I don't like this, I don't have to continue. I'll just try the eight weeks. Um, I, I did the same thing several years later with a kendo program. I said, you know what? I'd just like to try kendo. It's eight weeks, twice a week. Let me just try it. And if I don't like it when, it, when it's done, I just won't go back. So I did, the, I did this eight-week Krav Maga program, and uh, I loved it right away. It was just exactly what I was looking for. It was a good instructor, heavy fitness component in, in Krav. Uh, I liked the, the motion. Um, you know, emphasis on, on fighting, um, which later on I would decide I didn't like so much, but, uh, it, it seemed to check all the boxes. Uh, and, and even the universe was conspiring against me to not have me go because I signed up for it in January of 2016, right in the middle of winter. 
And I got into a car accident um, driving back from class one night because I decided to go even though it was really snowy out. Um, and the people around here don't know how to drive in the winter like those of us from New England. Um, I was rear-ended basically. Um, so, <laughs> but uh, I, could, I still kept going. And after that, I signed up and I ended up studying there for, for uh, three and a half years. Wow. Okay, so for three and a half years, so now there's another transition? Yeah, yeah. So there's one more. All right, keep, keep them going. This is where I am now. So uh, <laughs> uh, along the way with Krav, I realized a couple of things. One of them was it's very much uh, kind of an aggression-based system, like short, short sharp violence to deal with a problem, to be able, deal with a problem and uh, extract yourself from that situation, which has its place. The situational awareness aspects are great. The, the de-escalation aspects, the um, specialized training, all of that is really wonderful. But that is, at the end of the day, that is really not my personality. I'm not confrontational. I don't like whenever I spar. I do not want to be aggressive. Uh, I'm not like. I'm going to kill this person. I just don't, that is not me, right? I, that's not in my DNA. Second aspect was um, whenever we did the ground parts of it, initially I thought I would never do this because we, ne- we didn't do a whole lot of Nawaza in judo. So I didn't really have a lot of ground experience. I, you know, I did like wrestling and gym class like everybody in New England does when you're a kid. But I, when I ended up doing it in, in the craft class, I thought, oh, this is actually pretty cool. And I had a lot of friends who were in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, even some guys who would eventually we're like black belt levels, which, you know, takes 10 years or so. And so I realized, you know, this, there might be something to this. I, I should probably check this out. And there were uh, a couple of, there was a school in um, way far south of me that had these, these like five hour intensive seminars. And they had one of them that was just all, all BJJ, five hours, just come like 6am to 11am, just do this. So I went and I tried it and I thought, you know what, I could, I could do this. And it turns out um, I ended up seeing Professor uh, Pedro Sauer's video on YouTube from like 1994, 95 or so, where he, he had one of these uh, Gracie Challenge matches against a bodybuilder who's known as Mr. Utah, uh, Lance Bachelor, who outweighed him by 100 pounds. And I watched the video and I thought, this guy is my size. Professor is 150 pounds, 5'9", five, 5'10", five, five, same exact size as me. And here he is fighting this guy who should just by all, by all accounts, just destroy him. And he didn't. And I had seen the UFC when I was a kid or when I was, when I was younger, I remember even watching UFC four with my dad and just marveling at Hoist Gracie, but it never clicked to me. Like this is, this is what this is. But I realized professor Sauer was a mile from my craft school, like his headquarters for his entire, you know, 150 Academy affiliation where he personally teaches is it within walking distance of my, of my, of my craft school? I should at least see who this guy is, right? Just as, as a fan of the martial arts, I should check it out. And I went over there and uh, I think it was January 30th, 2017. I took my first class. It was a, a Gracie combatives lesson because they teach that there in addition to professor style. And I said, yep, I'm going to try this. People were chill. Um, it was not, you were not fighting to the death. You were not, you know, if you turned on the aggression, that was not the approach professor takes. He is, he is very much a role for life type person. Um, you know, he's, I think he's going to be 60 this year or may already be 60. And he, he, he tells us all the time, you know, if you, when, if you fight, like, you know, fight to the death all the time, you're going to end up like, like Hickson with a bad back with professor with like no cartilage in his shoulders. You know, this is not the way to be. We, you know, don't make the same mistakes we did when we were in our twenties and thirties and, um, you know, change the way you, the way you train so that you can train, you know, for long, longevity and you can enjoy the art when you're, when you're, when you're old. And so that was the message I needed to hear as, a, as someone who at that point was 46, I think, <laughs> you know, uh, if I'm going to be rolling with a 20 year old, I don't want them thinking that they need to take my head off in order to prove how good they are. You know, I need a, a different sort of culture. And that's not the same. Okay. Like every, every gym is different. Every martial art, uh, school is different, but when you find the one that fits what you're looking for, you know, that's what'll, that's what'll keep you around. And so that's where we are now. I've, I ended up, once I, I got my graduate rank in Krav, I, I switched, um, cause it was very difficult for me to keep both systems in my head at the same time, honestly. And I switched just to jujitsu full time and, uh, I'd be training now if it weren't for coronavirus, but, um, you know, I actually, because of my arth- rheumatoid arthritis, I, I can't train 
um, or even if they were open, I wouldn't train because I'm considered like that vulnerable population. So it may be, I don't know, months before I, I ever go back, but I will one day. When we talk to people who've trained in a number of different styles, one of two things happens. Either, and this is me, the first thing you train becomes the lens through which you see everything else. Or you tend to search, hunt, try to find that thing that resonates. Is it fair to say that PJJ is what resonates for you? I think so. I, I... <sighs> Here's the other thing, Jeremy. I am not particularly physically gifted. Uh, when I was in high school, I was I was a I was an athlete who the reason I could be an athlete was I could run in a straight direction for distance. <laughs> uh, that was my skill. Uh, so I I was captain of the track team, but again, that was because I could I could run. Uh, I was not a good runner. Um, I eventually became a good runner, but it took me essentially a year before I could do that. And that's actually something I'm really proud of. I, I was the most improved cross country runner because I was dead last of like 60 kids and I was third fastest by the time I was a senior. So, uh, but that is the only thing I had done really otherwise, um, beyond, beyond the martial arts. So when it comes to learning all these different styles, I am just not that physically gifted. And I, it is. I mean, it took me three years to get my blue belt in BJJ. I, I mean, part of that was because I took some time off to focus on Krav because the grading for the, the G1 test was was really difficult for me. Um, but I am not the type of person who's going to fly through the ranks based on skill or learning ability. I mean, it probably took me a year just to be able to watch the instructor teach something and to be able to go, turn around and replicate, at least to try to replicate what I saw. Um, I mean, that's, it sounds like, I mean, there's some people who they just, they can do that very, very instinctively, or they even know what to do, really. But for me, um, I'm very good with, with um, sort of normal academic book testing and such. But when it comes to integrating that um, physicality and turning it into something, it took me a long time. I mean, only this year recently, or in the, maybe in the last six months, when I've been rolling, have I been able to pull off some stuff and only really from a defensive perspective, like when I'm rolling with, a, say, like a purple belt or even, even a, a good white belt or blue belt, I can stay out of trouble now. <laughs> it took me a long time just to be able to protect myself from getting submitted repeatedly. So um, I, I just don't have it from these other arts. Like a lot of the things that I learned in other arts just don't translate into, into a, a grappling art, especially a, a, you know, sure. a ground grappling art. Um, so I had to learn everything. And because I'm a slow learner, uh, it's just taken me a long time to, to be able to put any of that together. How'd you end up running track then? Oh, so when we talk about the different reasons you do martial arts, one of them is community. I did it. I did it completely for community. Um, I, I decided during the end of my sophomore year that I wanted to change who I was in school. Um, one of my goals, and this is really kind of, uh, I don't even know how to characterize it. It's really amazing when I think back on it was there was a table of kids who would sit together who were basically the captains of the different sports teams. And all of the kids I admired were sitting at that table. Um, and I remember thinking, I want to be able to sit at that lunch table one day. And so I said, I need to reinvent myself. I need to find new friends. I need to, not that my old friends were bad or anything. I mean, I, they were doing some stuff that eventually turned into bad things. I'm glad I wasn't involved with that. But um, I just decided I wanted to like reboot myself kind of. And I, said, I thought, what's, what's one way I could do that? And I thought, well, maybe I should, I should join a sports team. And I, again, I looked and said, what, what, skills do I have? <laughs> I can run in a straight line. Okay. Uh, I will join the cross country team. And it was grueling. And it was, you know, the best part of it was when it was over, but I was in a team, I was on a team and being part of a team, you're invited to things like, Hey, you know, uh, you want to join us for this, you know, we're going out or whatever, whatever stupid thing, you know, teenagers do. And so that's, that's why I joined the sports team, uh, the, the cross country team. And then I did indoor and outdoor track too. And it turned out that was very, very helpful later on when I w uh, applied to the Air Force Academy because, I mean, if I had not had that, 
that athletic base, I would have had a much more miserable time in basic training and survival school and all that kind of stuff. Oh, makes sense. Yeah. And the funny thing, it's cool to see my daughter, my older daughter now, she has gone through the same exact process. She joined her high school wrestling team. Uh, it's a, it's a co-ed team. And she went to the sports night just, or it was like club and sports night. And she was just walking around the big gym and a kid walked up to her and said, Hey, you look athletic. Have you thought about trying the wrestling team? And she had never thought there was even such a thing possible, but for whatever reason, she said, you know what, I'm going to try the wrestling team, even though she had, she had done sw swimming when she was a little bit younger. And it was the best thing that happened to her. She's on this team now. She has a whole new group of friends. She made it into that really difficult part of being a high school freshman and uh, she even enjoyed wrestling. And I'm, I worry much less about her knowing that, uh, you know, if anybody threatens her or whatever, she can put the hurt on, on them. <laughs> and they're not going to mm. expect it probably. So if you're, if you're anyone who's in high school, if you might be listening, uh, join your wrestling team. I think it's, uh, it's great for many reasons. Um, the the um, camaraderie, the, uh, the mental uh, attitude and so forth. Of course, if you're on a, you know, an abusive or a bad wrestling team, you don't want to be part of that. But I think uh, if you're on a good, you know, you can find a good wrestling team, then it's worthwhile. And it's one of those things you really only have a small window of opportunity to do basically high school and college. And wrestling is, is a, a phenomenal discipline for just overall health. I mean, I, I've met high school wrestlers that just their, their knowledge of their body, their strength, their endurance you know, even years later, not having done anything for five years, just in incredible shape. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, for girls, it's really wonderful. Um, I think a lot of people were surprised when um, women's no gi jujitsu took off like it did. Many people thought, well, maybe they'll like gi jujitsu. Um, Stefan Kesting has talked about this quite a bit, but no gi just took off. And I think wrestling is the next level of that. And it's for younger people. And you're seeing some crossover. Um, there's, a, there's a young lady on my daughter's team who, who did judo for many years. So she goes in there and she takes down her opponents with judo. And then she goes straight into Kesekatame and pins them, um, which is great. She, she wins matches in some cases in seconds. Um, we have another young lady who is, I think she's either the first or she's the first from our region to ever win at the state level in a boys tournament and she got to that point because she's been studying brazilian jiu-jitsu since she was four or five and she her body awareness and her strength and her ability is just unbelievable and her brother is also the same situation um, she's a junior he's a he's a freshman um, and so same story right they they have these skills they have this attitude and um, it's definitely definitely good i but that, that the thing is if you've, if you've missed that window like me, you know, I, I missed all that, it's okay. There's, there's something out there that's good for you at whatever age you're at. You, know, you can't join a, a, an MMA gym at age 50 or 60 and decide that you're going to you know, become the next Conor McGregor or whatever. But there's other things you can do. So if you've ever thought about trying it, I would suggest go ahead and just find the right one for you. I want to go back to that, that break, that time off that you took. I think you said it was 15 years. Yeah. And that's a lot longer than most people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. So we, we, when we talk about people taking breaks, you know, it's often there. And, and, you know, we've got a decent sized sample set now, you know, from this show. We, we talk to people who, you know, maybe they hit 12, 13, and they step away and then they to find it college, maybe shortly thereafter. So um, almost 15 years. Or you get people who train into their 20s and then, you know, family happens and they start doing it with their kids. So, you know, that might be eight, 10 years mm -hmm. when we hear from some of them. But what strikes me as interesting in the way you talk about it is even though you had that time off, the way you talked about going back, there wasn't any, I'm not hearing any, any apprehension, there was no tentativeness in the way you talked about it. Were you anxious about starting again or did it feel like the right thing, like destiny? <laughs> so I was definitely anxious. Okay. And uh, this is a story that the, uh, the owners of the crop school will tell people sometimes. I had just had surgery on my back in December of that year. And when I say back surgery, it wasn't like structural. It was, um, I think I had like 
some something on my back, the skin was was taken off. And so I thought, okay, well, shoot, I just had this surgery. The doctor said I'm not supposed to like basically do anything, but I'm starting this class on January 6th or whatever day it was. Uh, so I remember asking the doctor, like, well, what, what really do I have to be careful of? And I was like, well, be careful of like stretching or, mo you know, lifting these various activities. So I thought, okay, well, maybe I could find a way because I, I didn't really know anything about what Krav Maga would be like, but I thought, eh, I'll just be careful. I'll take care of myself. I'll, I'll be all right. So I go to the, I go to the class and, and I'm waiting to, to participate and I'm seeing what people are doing. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is way more active. This is way more aggressive than I ever imagined based on any of the styles I had done. There is stuff on the ground. There's, oh my goodness, this is, am I in the right place? And I remember um, I, I actually st t stood up and I started walking towards the door because I had decided I need to come back later. And the school owner inter intercepted me and she said, oh, Richard, hi, I, are, are you Richard? Yes, well, here's your card for class. She basically, she didn't know I was leaving, but she unconsciously uh, kept me from leaving <laughs> or subconsciously kept me from leaving. And so I said, okay, fine. And wouldn't you know it, the first thing we do once we got onto the mat, uh, Krav Maga, at least the, the Krav Maga global system, uh, most everything starts with a warm up and a game of some kind. And, and sometimes the two are combined. And one of the games we were doing, touch the shoulder. So uh, it's supposed to like teach you awareness and a little bit of blocking. And again, it's just a warm up type thing. But what are people doing? They're reaching over and grabbing your shoulder, which is basically where I had my, mm -hmm. my whole back was, was taped up. So I had a really great incentive to protect that right side from all the people who were trying to touch it. Um, but I made it through, I made it through the class and um, you know, that was fine. I went the next week and everything worked out. What was the emotional situation getting back into martial arts after so long oh it was a uh, it was euphoria i was so pleased to find this this thing i had missed and i had kind of knew i'd missed it but not really not until i was there did i really understand wow i really missed this and i had experienced something like that a little bit with with ice hockey because being from New England, everyone learns how to skate, maybe not the best like myself, but you know, you learn something and you play with your friends on frozen ponds and all. So I had, I had played like pickup hockey and a little bit of men's hockey in college and uh, not with the school, but like you know, men's league outside of school. And then um, I had, when I was back in Massachusetts, I had played some men's league hockey and I even played some men's league hockey in, in, uh, in Virginia here as well. And so I had experienced that, you know, this, I really enjoy this. I look forward to it. I try to find ways to improve myself. I did some camps, all that sort of thing. Um, but until I had been, a, you know, not been doing anything physical because of um, the issue with the arthritis, and uh, also I had had some surgeries in my my right shoulder for injuries that I had I had incurred as a cadet that I didn't even realize had never been fixed. Just to, I just lived with it for forever. Um, yeah, so you're probably hearing at this point that I have this tendency just to suffer in silence. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's only something recently that I have decided like, no, you don't need to do that. You can, if you have a problem, you can go out and try to tr and try to fix it. It's not your, your burden to just carry these, these issues. Um, yeah. But once I had gotten back to martial arts, I realized, wow, I really missed this. And I, and I went through my normal blitz of, you know, are there any books about this topic? Are there any videos, podcasts, you know, so I found your podcast uh, I just sort of immersed myself in it, and uh, you know, it's it, now with with my martial history team, I'm looking at sort of a different take on all of this. But um, I do I do sort of like get really caught up um, as as sort of part of my personality. T tell us about martial history. Yeah, what's going on with that? Yeah, so anyone who's been who's trained in the martial arts will hear stories like if you're in like Chinese martial arts or some type of Kung Fu, like Kung Fu is 5,000 years old and it was founded by Bodhidharma who took it from the East and he taught the Shaolin temple and the Shaolin monks, are the originator of all martial arts, or whatever. Or if you're in Krav Maga, you'll hear Krav Maga was invented by Emi Lichtenfeld in the 1950s in Israel. And he taught everybody else. Um, or if you're in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you'll hear, well, the Gracies learned from Mitsuyo Maeda, who's Count Koma and, um, they invented it and whatever. Well, there's, these are all these stories that we tell each other. And when you sort of try to look for 
history, like documentation or anything that's reliable about those topics, you, you learn that it's very, very different. The question is, how do you know what's, what's reliable and what's not? And so over the course of the last four years or so, I've been slowly acquiring uh, a library of, of books that I find to be useful. And it occurred to me that I could probably be of service if I were to share what I've learned and what, I'm, what I continue to learn and continue to research with people who have the same question. So, you know, is it true that, you know, those three stories I told you, are, are any of them true? And it turns out we're at the point, um, generally, like over the last 10 years, more and more um, credentialed, uh, reliable um, researchers are producing works that examine this sort of thing. And a perfect example that you're well aware of because you profiled them on your show was, was Alec Gillis and A Killing Art about the history of Taekwondo. Um, that book, so I read it and it blew my mind. You know, I had studied Taekwondo and it, under the ITF with, with, you know, with General Choi and all that. And um, when you read what happened, it's just amazing. It's not at all what you're, what you're told in, in class. And so what I'm doing with Marshall History Team is first I'm doing a literature review. So I'm just trying to find out what's the best sources we have out there on various topics. Initially, I was sort of concentrating on the Japanese arts, more directly on the grappling arts, because I have more interest and in, in experience with that. But I've also expanded it beyond that. So um, uh, like basically jujitsu led to judo, which led to jujutsu, the original. Um, I've expanded now out into the historical European martial arts. And I'm while I'm interested in sort of just what's available in documentation, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the grappling aspects of it because you'll even encounter some people in the, um, in the Japanese arts who believe, or the Asian arts who believe, well, the European guys, any grappling they have, they just learned it because when the Dutch and the Portuguese sent their traders to Japan in the 16th century, they just observed what the Japanese were doing. And then they took that back to Europe and that's how they know how to, that's why they know how to grapple. You know, this, the myth of the single origin is, is alive and well. Um, so uh, there are you know, various topics within the history of martial arts that I'm, I'm paying attention to. And my goal is to identify and promote the best sources that we have out there. And if I were to have like a stretch goal, if at some point there's, you know, I'm, I'm able to you know, have any kind of financial uh, association with this, I'd like to uh, have grants and awards for people who could write uh, either papers or even better yet books on some of these topics. You know, I would love to see somebody like Alex Gillis or Matthew Pauly, who wrote the wonderful Bruce Lee biography, which is another one of these, like, here's the truth about Bruce Lee, whether you like it or not, this is what this, you know, who this guy was. But I'd love to see people like that write a story of the Gracie family. Like what really happened with the Gracies? There, there's been some stuff that's out there. Um, but you know, to have like a professional biographer write about that would be really, really interesting. So, mm. uh, you know, at this point with the Marshall History Team, uh, there's a Facebook page and I sort of, I sort of uh, produce regular content there, um, little, bit, little bits of things that I'm looking at, things that are a little bit more in depth, I put on the associated blog um, for Mar Marshall History Team. Uh, like last night, I just wrote a, a little article about um, the American, what was it called? The American College of Physical Jiu-Jitsu or it's something like that. I don't remember the exact, it's, it's this grand title that uh, was essentially assigned by two gentlemen who lived in Boston in the early 1900s. And they wrote what you might consider what it, to be the first infomercial for jiu-jitsu, um, complete with pictures of a guy with a big belly who apparently after 15 weeks of my special jujitsu course available by correspondence now has a trim figure and it's, it's just hilarious. Right. And they have a picture of this building and it's actually been Photoshopped so that the, um, the title of their school is like printed at the top. And yet you find the building today in, in um, on Boylston street in Boston. And there's, you could tell there was never a sign there. Um, so it's that sort of thing. I, I'm trying to, to bring, uh, solid research and with sourced references based on, on documentation and what we can actually learn about the history of these arts and let people read it and, and see what they think. And how about those three examples that you gave? You know, body dharma and... Yeah. 
you want to hear the stories on those? Well, I just <laughs> are 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 you willing to share? You know, I'm wondering if you'll you'll give people the cliff notes on the the truth oh, or not. Yeah. So if you want the Bodhidharma story, um, there's a couple of really great re uh, references. One is Peter Lorge and his book, Chinese Martial Arts. The other one is a guy named uh, Mayor Shahan, and his book is called The Shaolin Monastery. You read those books, and these are both academic. They're both, but that's actually what's kind of cool about this field is you can both be an academic and a practitioner. So, you know, Peter is a, is a, he's done many martial arts, but I think most recently he's doing jujitsu and Shahan is similar. He does Japanese arts, I believe. But in both those cases, what you learn is that to the extent you can even say Bodhidharma existed, he probably existed, but there's very likely no chance that he brought physical arts with him. Um, he's, but he can be credited with introducing Chan or Zen Buddhism into China. And that's what he should be remembered for. And it's not to denigrate him, it's to say, no, that's important. It's just that he didn't sit in a cave, stare at a wall for nine years, invent Kung Fu and teach the Shaolin monks. That's, you know, that's basically not, they go into it very extensively in their books. So I, that's what I'll just say with, with those guys. Um, with the Gracies, the Gracies should, in my opinion, and in the opinion of, of the few people who actually are doing really like decent work on this and Ro Roberto uh, Pedro Ira, his books, uh, Shock and Craze, are the best resources on this. Um, there's also a paper that was just released in the uh, Martial Arts Research Network scholarly journal that just came out by um, Jose Kairos. And the basic conclusion with the Gracies is they took, they, they took uh, Judo Nawaza and they preserved it as a specialist art because they were not very good at throwing. Um, when they encountered Japanese judokas who, who would throw them relentlessly, the Gracies could not compete with that. Um, so they specialized in Nawaza, which although you know Nawaza is part of judo, um, it was not the specialty of many of the judoka who were, who were encountering the Gracies, uh, unless you talk about something like Kimura, who when you saw how that match went. Um, the Gracies um, probably did not learn um, they're essentially judo from Mitsuyo Maeda. They probably learned it from one of his students. And when they opened up their academy, it did not open in 1925. There was no Gracie Academy in 1925. It looks more likely that the first academy was opened either in 1930 or 1931. And it was opened by, by one, of the, uh, one of Maeda's students. And the Gracies were the assistant instructors. And within a year, that uh, person who had opened the school, I think his name was Dos Paris or something like that. Uh, he had moved on and the Gracies assumed control of it and they became the Gracie Academy in say 1931. They should receive credit for preserving their style of art as a distinct art from judo because pretty much everyone else turned to judo because it was just becoming more popular and eventually it was in the Olympics and so forth. Um, and then uh, Horion Gracie, one of Elio's, or Elio's oldest son, he should be remembered as the guy who invented the UFC because prior to the UFC, jiu-jitsu wasn't even a thing that big in, in Brazil. Like jiu-jitsu took off in Brazil after the UFC because it was seen as a way for um, people who were practicing jiu-jitsu to have a living. Like they could actually do something now. They could teach, they could become fighters, they could make some money. People saw the UFC, they wanted to learn and so forth. Um, and then finally with, with uh, what, was the third, what was the third one we talked about? Was it Krav Maga? Hema? Oh, Hema and grappling. Oh, and gra Hema and grappling. Yeah, there is no evidence that that the arts that were practiced grappling wise in Europe are derived from from Japanese arts. Um, it's simply uh, falling for the myth of the single origin. In other words, if people punch, the idea that everyone learned to punch from one person, or if people know how to do a hip throw, it's because everyone learned from that single person. Um, as as you and many others have said many times, we've all got you know. You know, hopefully we all have two arms, two legs, um, and a torso and a, and a head. So the things that you can do with that skill set or, you know, that physical set um, are defined. And um, the fact that you can look at 4,000-year-old artwork from Beni Hassan in, a G in Egypt and see people doing many of the techniques that are around today in wrestling does not mean that people in Egypt spread that art across the world. It simply means that they documented the wrestling that they knew at that time. Um, now, that's not to say that in recent years, 
things have not been transferred from place to place. But the question is, can we, is it even possible to answer those questions? In some cases we can, right? Uh, the Takanuchi Ryo School in Japan has documentation stretching back to the founding of the school in 1532. And they are the oldest continuous existing martial arts system that we know of. So that, that's basically to the, to the middle of the 16th century. And they have records going back to that time. They have a complete lineage. Uh, they have contemporary documents at each point of their existence. So that's an example of a system you could look at and say, yes, this is, this is how it has been um, in comparison to something you know, that is um, much more recent, really. I mean, most martial arts, the way that we understand them, the way that we think about them with a gi and a black belt and all that, that basically dates to Jigoro Kano in the late uh, 19th century, right? He, he invented judo in 1882. Um, the, the color belt system, which often is erroneously attributed to um, a gentleman who introduced it in France, he actually picked it up in uh, London when he visited there in the 1920s. So, uh, and, and we, we have documentation from the, the Budokwai school in London where they talk about awarding colored rank in their, um, their, the minutes of their, their school meetings. So um, it's really cool when you start pull, you know, poking at these things and you find, no, we actually have some documentation that says this, is, this existed at this point in this time. And in other cases, we just don't know because people didn't write it down. Super cool. Yeah, the, the body dharma stuff, you know, I dug into that a little bit. The other two I wasn't, I wasn't so sure of. So thanks yeah. for sharing that. It's, I, I find it fascinating. I mean, the, the two big themes I, I often hear is that um, things are much newer than we expect them to be. Um, yeah. Most martial arts are very recent, at least the way we understand them. Uh, that, that sort of blows my mind. Like every time you hear, and, and I think the reason people want it to be older is because there's this idea that it's, it's a very Chinese idea, actually, that if it's older, it must be better. And it's been a cultural um, aspect of the of the Chinese mentality that in order to have something now be seen as good, you need to link it to something very old, which is sort of the antithesis of the United States. Like we kind of prefer like fresh, new, hey, this is new thing, you need to try it. Whereas in China, the idea is if I can link this to something that is much older, that's as, that sort of gives it a grounding and a foundation and people are more willing to accept it. And I think that's why you see a lot of these arts um, that have that have Chinese derivations or associations. This idea that oh well, I need to show that it really does stretch all the way back to to the fifth century A.D. because um, that makes my art better than yours, which is only fifty years old. Right, right, yeah, it, it's silly, and I'm fully expecting that you know we'll get some some comments, maybe you know some emails about what you're saying here, and people refuting one of the things that you you've said. So. Um, I look at it and I find it intellectually interesting, but completely irrelevant to my training. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing, right? Some people will say, well, who cares? Just train. And that's fine. Um, I, I, you know, I don't worry about who invented. I mean, I've got pictures of, of Carlos and Elio Gracie, Hicks and Gracie and Pedro Sauer at my, my school. And, and you know, I don't care you know, what, who actually invented whatever, when I'm trying a technique, it doesn't make any difference to me because all right. that matters is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm able to do it, whether it works and so forth. Um, it may, it might matter sometimes if people are, say they want to be, you know, authentic, whatever that is. Like I want to be the way it was, the way the master taught it. Um, you know, so it's, it's just your personal preference. Absolutely. Let's talk about the future. Yeah. So we've talked about where you've been. We've talked about where you are. Where are you going? Well, I think at some point I would like to separate myself from the information security world. I've, uh, I think I'm setting myself maybe for a five-year time frame. Um, that would have put me um, at the, what did I say, 27-year point or something like that, which would mean I've spent roughly half my life in information security. So I'd kind of like to get out of that as a, as a full-time job. And I would much rather do something, I think, with the martial arts. Um, if I can do that with martial history team, that would be great. Um, if not, you know, we'll see. We'll see what's, what's available. I don't know necessarily if I would be able to teach. Like I said, I'm not very physically gifted. In five years, I would probably be a high purple belt 
in jujitsu because I'm slow and uh, it takes a long time to get rank. So I'm not going to be at the point where I would be able to open a school at any time. Um, but you know, you never know, maybe I could help teach or, or contribute in another way. And I think that's, that's kind of interesting too, is that if, if I'm able to make it work a little bit with martial history team, maybe that by that point, I'll be helping people write books. Um, I have, you know, I've shown that I could do that before. So maybe I could, I could assist with that and maybe have a little publishing house. So, uh, I don't have any sort of set goals as far as where I want to be, but I do have some ideas of things that I think would be uh, rewarding and enjoyable. Great. And if people want to find you? Yeah. Um, if you search my name, I'm the guy you're going to find. There's only one Richard Baitlick, you know, thanks. You know, sorry, dad. Um, my dad is very quiet as far as, you know, his presence on the internet. If you want to see anything with information security, if you look for TAO security, yeah, so DAO security. And yes, my first book was called DAO of Network Security Monitoring because Bruce Lee had wrote DAO of Jeet Kune Do. <laughs> so uh, I, I did name it that way. Um, but probably more interesting for the audience, uh, the Marshall History Team. If you search for that term, Marshall History Team, you're going to find our Facebook page, which I think is just facebook.com slash Marshall History Team. Um, there's a blog, marshallhistoryteam.blogspot.com. We have, I tried to follow your example, Jeremy. I tried to get all the social media accounts. Um, uh, Twitter, you're limited to, I think, a certain number of characters. So it's just Marshall History T. Uh, I think we're Marshall History Team on Instagram as well. But probably the easiest thing to, to track is the Facebook page because that's where all the content comes out regularly with, with porn just anything else that's uh, interesting to the audience. And awesome. if you do have other opinions, like you're like, no, I have documentation that says Bodhidharma did this, or I, you know, this is the, this true story of the Gracie family. Send it my way. I'm, you know, I'm a scientist in this perspective. I'm, you know, you've got a hypothesis. If you've got other data that refutes it or proves it, I'm totally interested in that. I, I'm just interested in, in what's, what's provable and what's knowable. Spoken like a true researcher. <laughs> I like it. All right. Well, you know what comes next. It's, it's the end. So how do you want to close this up? What final words would you have for the listeners today? Two, two pieces of advice. The first one is uh, listen to that small voice. Everyone has it, but most people, um, I don't think most people know about it or they, or they dismiss it. And it really only comes when you're quiet, I think. So Maybe some, for some people, it's very loud, but for me, it's a very, very small inner voice. So take the time to listen and say, um, you know, what little voice, what, what do you think I should be doing or what would make me happy or what's the right thing to do here? So, so listen to that. And then the second one would be, once you find whatever it is that that little voice is, is telling you uh, to do, is to pay attention to it and to, uh, I, I use the term, be devoted. Um, one of the uh, authors of a judo textbook I was looking for um, I contacted him directly and was texting back and forth. This is a gentleman who, you know, he's a retired judoka. And uh, I was talking to this guy via text because he put his phone number on his website. And uh, when he sent me his book uh, in, the, in the, the front page, he signed it and he wrote in Japanese some characters, which I didn't know, I understood what they meant. And so he, he, he wrote in small characters, look on page 31. So I turned to page 31 and he had written that the motto for, for his practice was be devoted. And he had those same Japanese characters that he had written by hand. And I thought, this was what a wonderful message um, for one, the start of the martial history team project. So I thought, you know, be devoted. That's just a good way to live. Like once you figure out what you want to do with your life, be devoted to it. What a great conversation. Really enjoyed my time. And, you know, it's just good to finally connect to people. You ever have people that you know of, maybe you know a little bit, and you just want to know more? Well, that's about half the guests that we get on this show. But in particular, talking with Richard, I had a great conversation. And we had a great conversation even after the show ended. So thanks for coming on. I know we'll talk again. And I'm glad we finally got to do this. If you want more, head to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where you'll find photos and videos and links and social media and more for this and each and every episode we've ever done. If you're willing to support us, go to the store, make a purchase, use the code podcast15, or consider one of the other many options. Sharing an episode, leaving a review, telling a friend, or contributing to the Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. And if you see somebody out there wearing a whistlekick hat or something, talk to them. Say hi. Tell them that you listen to the show. Tell them that 
you're also a traditional martial artist. Maybe you can have a good conversation. Maybe you can have your own impromptu martial arts radio episode and share some stories. If you've got guest suggestions, we want to hear them. And we'd love to have you follow us on social media at Whistlekick everywhere you could think of. My email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Email me. I'll write you back. Now, until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Mm-hmm.